you have to decide what is your real currency, whether it's mental, emotional, social, safety and security, monetary, spiritual, whatever it is. Second, realize that there's more than one way to skin a cat. You might have thought the only way I could get it would be dancing on Broadway. That's not true. What you wanted was the feeling you would get from dancing on Broadway. Do not assume that dancing on Broadway is the only way to get that feeling. Hey, it's Dr. Phil, so you must have found your way to fill in the blanks. As you probably know, we are doing a series called Living by Design. This is number seven. So if this is the first one you're hearing, good news. You can binge listen to one through six. And I'm not going to waste time here reviewing one through six since they are available. And we also have a website, drfillintheblanks.com. And we have an outline of everything that we've done in one through six. You don't have to listen to one through six before you listen to this one, but you should go back and listen to them because we're talking about exactly what the title sounds like. This series is about living by design. It's about being who you are on purpose. Now, I'm not much of a theory guy. I'm not the kind of guy that says, empower yourself, find your inner self and be more of who you are. I'm not too much that way. I like to put verbs in my sentences, and I like to tell you things that when you get through listening to me, you can go do in your life today and tomorrow that changes your walk through this world, changes your life, changes your family, changes the way you interact with the people you care about. That's what I want to do. My goal here is to talk about things that matter to people who care. And I think that's you. I think that's why you're continuing to dial into this. So I'm going to jump right into number seven. I have a question to start out with. Do you consider yourself a reactor or a proactor when it comes to life? Are you reactive or are you proactive? Now think about that for a second. Do you spend your life reacting to what comes your way every single day? Or are you somebody that gets up and creates what you want to do every single day. Now, if you have a job and it's a career and you've been at it for a good while, then of course you react to that. But did you create that career? And was it what you wanted to do? And inside that career, are you rank and file doing what everybody wants you to do, being the kind of teacher you've been told to be, being the kind of police officer you've been told to be, being the kind of doctor you've been told to be, meeting the expectations of everybody around you, or are you proactive within your career and doing things the way you want to do it? It's okay to have something that you've been doing for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, but has it gotten stale? Are you reacting to what comes your way every day and you just kind of sit there and wait till you see what comes around the corner and that's what you're going to deal with? Or do you step back and say, hey, this is my time. This is my life, and I want a star in my life. I want a star in what I do, and so I want to be proactive. I want to do this my way. I love that Frank Sinatra song, I Did It My Way. Are you doing you your way? Or are you doing you the way you've been told to do you? I was reading a story today on the internet, dailymail.com. There are joint venture partners, full disclosure, for Daily Mail TV. And there was a story there about a woman by the name of Vanessa Lozano. She had a job working in a call center, and she was absolutely miserable, miserable. She was depressed. She was hating it. Now, her family had started an animal rescue organization. But she had taken this job in a call center. She was miserable. She talks about how she just up and quit that job because that wasn't her currency. You remember we talked about currency. She said, that wasn't what I wanted to do. That wasn't paying me off. So now, instead of going to a call center every day, she's bringing health back to monkeys, sloths, and kinkajous. I don't even know what those are, except they have a prehensile tail and they live in trees. There are pictures of her in there with the biggest smile on her face you can imagine. 
So she's not doing what she was supposed to do. She's doing what she wanted to do. Obviously, I'm advocating for you being proactive in your life. That doesn't mean you can quit all your responsibilities. I mean, if you've got three children, you can't drop them off at the mall and just take off. But you can do what you want to do within the confines of the responsibilities that you have. Now, we make decisions in our life every day, right? We decide what to have for lunch. We decide what to wear today. We decide what movie we're going to go see. We make a lot of decisions. But there's a whole other category of decision. And that category is what I call life decisions. I've talked about these just briefly before. Life decisions are those things that you make one time because they represent core values. They're life decisions that stick with you day after day, week after week, year after year. And it may have to do with your honesty, your integrity, your work ethic, your parenting philosophies. And you may not even be aware that you made them because they were so natural to you. Like you hopefully have made the life decision that you don't steal. You don't rob places. So if you wake up in the morning and you're late for work and you say, oh, well, man, I'm a little short on cash. Let's see, should I stop by that 7-Eleven and rob them, or should I run by the ATM? You don't have that debate with yourself every day, because a long time ago, you made the life decision that you just don't steal. So you don't have to debate that again every single day. Maybe you've made the life decision that you're going to have good personal hygiene. You're going to groom yourself. So you don't wake up every day and Decide, well, am I going to take a shower today? Am I going to brush my teeth? Am I going to put on clean clothes? You've made a life decision that the standard to which you live is going to do the best you have with what you've got. I grew up very poor, very poor. But as the old saying goes, and many people have said many times, we didn't have very nice clothes, but the clothes we had were clean. My mother always made sure that the clothes we had were clean, that we were clean. We brushed our teeth, combed our hair. We were clean, and the clothes we had were clean. And so there was just a life decision in our family that we were going to do the best we could with what we had. And as I grew up, I didn't have to make that decision fresh every day. Now, the reason I'm talking about this, have you made an active life decision about your attitude of approach to life? Have you made an active life decision about whether you're going to get up every day and who you are going to be and what you're going to do is going to be a function of what comes at you that day? Or can you make a life decision that says, you know what, I'm going to be the captain of my own ship. I'm going to choose what I do, what I pursue, how I determine what the rest of my life is going to be. You can make that life decision. And again, You might say, okay, Phil, you may have enough money where you can just quit what you're doing and go fly freight in and out of Africa or something. That's fine. But I, on the other hand, have a job. I've got kids in school. Your kids are grown. Mine are not. So I've got to continue to get a paycheck, et cetera, et cetera, every day. I get that. I'm not asking you to abandon your family. I'm not asking you to quit your job and go out and live off the land. I'm saying within the confines of the responsibilities you have, Are you doing everything you can to have the most satisfying life that's possible? And that's a life decision. In order to do that, you have to decide it's not selfish for you to take care of you, for you to do the things that you need to do to make you happy. And let me tell you who benefits when you make you happy. Everybody around you benefits. When you make you happy, You're a better husband or wife. You're a better son or daughter, a brother or sister, employer or employee. Doesn't matter. Whatever role, if you're more fulfilled, if you're more happy in your walk through life, everybody around you is going to benefit because they're going to get a better you than they do if you're just kind of gray and going through the motions, putting one foot in front of the other. Everybody benefits. So how do you do this? How do you make that life decision? Well, of course, you have to think about it. You have to decide, okay, I've been in reactive mode. I'm going to shift to proactive mode. How do I do that, Dr. Phil? I'm one that believes in operational definitions. What is an operational definition? If I tell somebody that's depressed, I want you to be happier, then 
I need to give them an operational definition of happier. What does happier mean? Well, it means smiling more and crying less, being more active in life. Old sayings get to be old sayings because they're profound. The old saying, you're not going to get a hit if you're not swinging. So it means getting out and getting up to bat. If you're depressed, you're going to sit at home, and when you sit at home, you have less chance to be reinforced. And the less reinforcement you get, the more depressed you become. The more depressed you become, the less active you are. The less active you are, the less chance you have to be reinforced. The less reinforcement you get, the more depressed you become. It's what I call an auto-exacerbating disease. You are circling the drain in ever-tightening concentric circles. There's just no way out of it until you decide, no, wait a minute. The operational definition of getting happy is to get out there in the world and do things that have the chance of rewarding me. So if I say, what's the operational definition of being happier? Well, you're going to smile more and cry less. You're going to be more interactive with the world where you have a chance of getting rewarded more. You're going to engage with people that are healthy for you and build up your self-worth and your self-esteem because they believe in you and say good things to you instead of being around toxic people who drag you down. You're going to start to take better care of yourself. Maybe you get depressed. You don't groom as well. You don't shower every day. So I'm going to tell you, you're going to shower every day. You're going to get up. You're going to get dressed. You're going to be out of the house at 730 every morning. You're going to go out and you're going to do something that's active. Well, I don't have a job. Then go volunteer somewhere. I'm going to give you the operational definition for what it means to be happy. To do that, I want you to be proactive. I want you to begin by making an appointment with yourself. Now, we make appointments with the doctor, the dentist. We make appointments with our kids to go to their practice, to pick them up after school, to do this, to do that. We make appointments with everybody else. Let's make an appointment with ourselves and keep it. Start with 30 minutes a day, maybe an hour a day, where you make an appointment with yourself that you're going to figure out what you can proactively do to raise your game, what you can proactively do to get more of what you want and less of what you don't want out of your life. That's my operational definition of you making a life decision to become proactive rather than reactive in your life. The first step is to make an appointment with yourself and keep it and spend that time not with the TV on, not with the radio on, not answering the phone, not being interrupted by kids. And I don't care if you have to pull over on the way home to a rest area or a parking lot at the mall and sit there in your car with a pen and a pad and just write down the things you need to do to be proactive in your life. If you have to get up 30 minutes earlier every day, 30 minutes before everybody else gets up, or stay up 30 minutes later, or as I say, pull the car over on the way home and sit in a parking lot and have this meeting with yourself, make the life decision to focus on figuring out how I'm going to get more of what I want in life and less of what I don't want. This is a critical thing. You'll be astounded how much 30 minutes a day even five days a week, what kind of impact that would have in your life. Now, I'm saying all this in prelude to you continuing to work on your playbook for life. I'm setting all of that as a precursor to number seven. We've been through one through six. Number seven is you must always, always have a plan. You want to have a plan. You don't want to be reactive. You want to be proactive. And that means you've got to have a plan. And a plan begins with knowing what you want. That's what making that appointment with yourself every day will help you figure out. What do I want? Do I want more money? Do I want a bigger family? Do I want a closer walk with God? Do I want better health? Do I want better balance between my career and my family? You have to define, operationally define, success. What is success for you? And if you say, well, it's more money, you may think, well, that's awful shallow. That's okay. If that's your operational definition for success right now, don't be ashamed of that. If you want more money, you got to start somewhere. That's okay. If success for you right now is to have more money, then let's click that one off, and then we'll move on to the next one. What is your operational definition of success? You have to figure out what that is so you know how to choose one behavior over another. And believe me, every choice comes at a price. 
If you choose to focus more on your job, it comes at the expense of your family. If you choose to spend more time with your family, it comes at the expense of your career. What you hope to do is create a balance between the two, where you can get the most out of each that you want. In short periods of time, you might overbalance in one direction versus the other. Like if you're coming up at year end and you've got some big quotas you need to make to get a bonus for the year, you might really focus on work. If you're coming up where it's the middle of the summer and you want to plan some time with your family and take some time off with them and make a vacation, you might really spend a lot of time focusing on your family at that point. It doesn't always have to be one way or the other, but you need to decide what your definition of success is, what you want more of in your life and what you want less of in your life. Then you have to have a plan to get that. I said earlier that you have to be who you are on purpose. You don't want to be reactive to the sense that you're like a leaf floating in a stream. You just kind of go wherever the water flows. You hope it flows somewhere that you get paid off for, but if it doesn't, how does that work out for you? If it's not getting you closer to what you want, you're really burning daylight. You're really wasting time. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to evaluate every action you take against a standard, does this serve a purpose? Does it serve a purpose towards getting me what I want? I was talking to a prison consultant of all things earlier this year on fill in the blanks. His name was Justin Perperny. He is a convicted felon. He is a felon that spent a considerable time, more than a year, in the federal penitentiary. And he now consults with people that are going to prison. He actually speaks on behalf of the FBI. He works with the federal government, the people that put him in jail. He counsels people. And the reason I was talking to him is because there was this bribery scandal for getting students into school. And so we had all of these defendants that were saying, oh, my gosh, what do we do? And I was talking to Justin about it, and he was saying what he thought they all should do. If you want to hear that, you can go back and listen to that episode. But one of the things he said was really interesting. He said, one of the things you shouldn't do is you shouldn't get in there and get on the softball team. You shouldn't get in there and play sports. You shouldn't get involved in all these extracurriculars. And my thought was, hey, why not? It passes the time. And his question was a question that I ask everybody, which is, Does it serve your purpose? Your purpose is to get out of prison as fast as you can, as prepared for the next phase of your life as possible. And unless you're going to get out and be a professional softball player, then you don't want to waste time playing softball. You have a finite amount of discretionary time You need to spend that time in the library. You need to spend that time investigating what your options are going to be after prison. What can you do? What can't you do? Educate yourself. Figure out how to reinvent yourself. Maybe you need to figure out how to appeal your case. Maybe you need to figure out 10 different things, but you're not going to find them on the softball diamond. Why in the world would you play softball? It does not fit your purpose, which is to get out of prison as fast as you can, as prepared as you can for the next stage of your life. And it made perfect sense to me because I preach that very thing. Evaluate every behavior in terms of whether it serves your purpose. Because what I want you to do is take specific actions toward a known outcome. Let me say that again. Take specific actions toward a known outcome. Now, if you don't know the outcome that you're trying to get, you cannot evaluate whether you should play softball or not. You can't evaluate which specific actions you should take and which specific actions you should not take. You have nothing to measure it against unless you know what that outcome is. Now, think about this. You've been downtown in the mall, in a park or whatever. Contrast these two images. There's somebody in the park and they're just taking a walk. They're in no particular hurry. 
they're just really enjoying nature. They're kind of walking along. There's cut grass. They're smelling that. Maybe they're feeding some pigeons. Maybe they're looking at the flowers, listening to the birds. They're on a stroll. Contrast that to a man or woman coming the other direction who has just left their office, going to a meeting on the other side of the park, and they got 10 minutes to get there, and it takes 15. How are they walking? They're walking with purpose. They have a spring in their step. They're not speed walking like in the Olympics, but they are walking with purpose, right? They're not strolling along. They're not feeding the pigeons. They're not enjoying the flowers. They might do that at another time, but right now, they are walking with purpose. They are walking to achieve a particular goal, and that is to get from A to B in X number of time, to be at this meeting, to deliver a message, to achieve a goal, to make a sale, to negotiate something. Maybe it's just to deliver a pouch. But they've got an objective. They know what it is. They know what they have to do. And they are moving with purpose. How are you going through life? You feeding the pigeons or are you headed somewhere? Unless you have arrived, you should not be feeding the pigeons. You should be walking with purpose. Taking specific actions towards a known outcome. Now, does that mean there's never a time that you feed the pigeons? Does that mean there's never a time that you stroll through the park? Of course there is. But that's not what we're talking about right now, is it? We're talking about affecting change in your life and getting you more of what you want and less of what you don't want. And if you listen to what I'm telling you, you will have more time to feed the pigeons. You will have more time to enjoy the flowers and the cut grass because you will have achieved more of what you want and need to take care of you and your family. You will have overcome mental illness. You will have achieved more money. You will have found more peace. You will have achieved whatever it is in your life. Listen, this can be anything that you're after. Like I said, maybe it's money. Maybe it's to get a promotion at your job. Maybe it's to get him to pop the question. But you have to have a plan to do that. I told you in the beginning that... You weren't going to have to cheat, but this wasn't for the squeamish either, because life is competition. Make no mistake. You may not want it to be. You may say, well, Dr. Phil, that's just not the way I see it. Uh, Okay, then hit the stop button and go do something else. But I'm telling you the truth, whether you like it or not. If you don't think the place you work is competitive, then one of us is a fool because the place you work is competitive. You say, well, these are my friends. We go to lunch together. Well, that's right. And while you're at lunch, you may not be all that competitive in that moment. But if there are 10 of you in one work group and one of you is going to get promoted, do you think the other nine are not competing with you for that promotion? If you don't see that, then you are being Pollyannish because they are. And listen, there's nothing evil about that. There's nothing wrong with them competing with you. The only mistake you can make here is to not recognize it. What I want you to do is have a plan to overcome any inertia in your life. It's going to require you manipulating people. And let me be very clear about this. Manipulation in and of itself is not a negative. I am attempting to manipulate your thinking right now. Manipulation is only a negative if it is insidious, if it is hidden, if there's a hidden agenda, if there is some underhanded objective that People try to get you misdirected away from so they can manipulate you. They try to get you to look over here to the right when they're really picking your pocket on the left. Manipulation is just that. If you pick up a shirt and fold it, you're manipulating the shirt. If you're talking to your child and trying to get them to tie their shoe, you're teaching them to manipulate the laces in their shoe. 
I'm trying to manipulate your thinking right now, and I'm not doing it insidiously. I'm telling you up front. I'm attempting to get you to change your thinking to a more healthy, proactive way. The reason there's nothing wrong with me attempting to manipulate you about that is because I'm telling you up front. And if anything I say won't withstand challenge, then reject it. But I'm telling you right up front, anytime you go into a class and they're teaching you something you don't know, then they're manipulating your mind. They're giving you new information. If they're debating with you, they're trying to get you to change your position. The only time it's insidious is if it's hidden and there's misdirection involved. So just know that's how I use the word manipulation. I'm trying to manipulate your life to overcome inertia. And in order to do that, you have to have an action plan and you have to write it down. You have to write it down. Life law number three that I talk about in a book I wrote back in 1998 is that you create your own experience. Life law number four is people do what works. You create your own experience. What does that mean? It means You create this aura around you. You create the principle of reciprocity. You get what you give. If you put out negative, you get back negative. You put out positive, you get back positive. If you put out energy, then you energize those around you. We create our own experience. And Life Law 4, people do what works. You don't repeat behaviors that don't work. You repeat behaviors that do work. My telling you that is trying to fill in some blanks in your thinking. Is that manipulative? I hope so, because I hope it's changing the way you think. I'm going to give you an example of manipulation here in just a few minutes, so stand by for that. But I say you have to write it down, and I'm going to talk to you about seven steps. I'm going to put these on our website, because right now, if you're driving or walking or you're mowing the yard or cleaning the house or whatever you're doing, and you don't have a pen and pad handy or you're not at your laptop and can't write them down, that's okay. I'm going to talk to you about them. But then I'm going to put the chart on the website so you can click on it and see exactly what's there. There are seven key strategies for attaining your goal. This is based on a list that I have espoused, as I say, since the 90s when I wrote about it in Life Strategies in 1998. You use it as a way to clearly define your goal. You're going to have to have a timeline, and you're going to have to have the steps necessary for achieving it. Now, number one, you have to express your goal in terms of specific events or behaviors. For example, my goal is to get a promotion. My goal is to get him to pop the question. My goal is to lose 30 pounds. It has to be specific. It can't just be, my goal is to do better in life. That's not it. It's got to be specific. So lose 30 pounds. Get him to pop the question and ask me to marry him. Get the promotion at work. It has to be specific. Number two, you have to express your goal in terms that can be measured. You can't just say, I need to be a better person. You have to operationally define that. What's the operational definition of better person? What does that look like? How can you measure that? 30 pounds, easy to measure. Getting him to pop the question, either does or he doesn't. But it has to be measured. Number three, you have to assign a timeline to your goal. We don't leap tall buildings in a single bound. We go up a floor at a time on an elevator. We don't have capes, so we got to do this a step at a time. You have to work this out with a timeline and then fill in the steps. It can't be, all right, I want to go back and finish my college degree, and I want to have it done in two years. Well, Well, okay, that's fine, but we need smaller bites than two years. So what are we going to do by the end of this month? Well, by the end of this month, you need to figure out what step you're going to do then. I'm going to have ordered my transcripts and made an appointment with an academic counselor 
to figure out exactly what courses I need to graduate. I'm going to get that done by the end of the month. I'm going to order my transcripts. As soon as I get them, within the next week, I'm going to make an appointment with a counselor at the college and go in and figure out exactly what I have to have to graduate. So that might be a timeline of two weeks to get the transcripts and two weeks to meet with a counselor. It's not two years I'm going to have a degree. You've got to fill in the steps. This is like walking across a creek and you've got to go from one stone to the next stone to the next stone to the next stone. We're not going to wade neck deep in water and then figure out a month before the two years is up, "Uh uh-oh, we didn't check all the boxes. Number four, you have to choose a goal you can control. Don't set a goal like, oh, we're going to have a white Christmas this year. Well, really? You don't control that. You got to choose something you control. There's got to be something that you have access to, that you can pull the levers on, which means it has to be about you. You're the only person you control. You can inspire others, but you only control you. Okay, then number five, you have to plan and program a strategy that will get you to your goal. So what we've done so far is you've expressed your goal in specific events and behaviors. You've done it in terms that can be measured. You've put it against a timeline. You've made sure to choose a goal that you can control. Now you've got to set a program or a strategy that will get you there. And you have to make sure that you've got the money, the time, and the access to do that. So you've got to be realistic here. We said go back to college and finish up your degree. Well, okay, you may want to do this in nine months, but the fact is you're working 50 hours a week. So the best you're going to do is six hours a semester, night school, which is two classes. You can do that two semesters, two long semesters, and then you can maybe do six hours over the summer. So you're going to get 18 hours a year. So two years is going to be 36 hours, okay? Is that two years or is that two semesters? Don't set a goal that's just not realistic. You're just going to disappoint yourself. And do you have the money to do that? If you don't, then you need to go back in your steps and put in there applying for an academic loan or figuring out how you're going to finance it. People say, I'm going to quit my job and become a real estate agent. Well, okay, but you know what? It might be six months before you collect your first commission. So do you have a plan to live until you collect that first commission? If not, this is a pipe dream. This isn't a goal. A goal has to be realistic. You have to have a way to get from where you are to where you're going. And that means, okay, I'm going to become a realtor, but I've got to finance that until I get to my first commission. So either my spouse is going to have to go to work if they don't already, or I'm going to have to have a part-time job that pays money every week. Be realistic about this. If you're going to set a goal You have to be realistic, and that means coming up with a plan that ensures that you have the money, the time, and the access. You need to identify what the potential obstacles are and what are the resources required to achieve it. And then define your goal in terms of steps. Make these steps something that keeps you moving week to week to week. I said earlier, it's got to be measurable, so Maybe the first step is ordering your transcripts. Second step is seeing a counselor. Third step is getting your finances in order. Fourth step is finding out what the deadline is for enrollment and arranging your schedule for child care, setting things up. Figure out what all of the steps are and put them in order so you know what you have to do to realistically do this. Let me tell you, when you start clicking these things off, you start to experience momentum. You look at yourself, it's like painting a black wall white or a white wall black. You see progress, and progress overcomes momentum. And when you overcome inertia, you get momentum. And when you do that, you start getting excited, you start getting energized. And number seven, 
is you have to create accountability. You've got to have somehow, some way, somebody that's going to check you out. Somebody that you really like, somebody you really trust, somebody has got the courage to call you out that's going to check with you every Friday, every Wednesday. Somebody's going to check you out and say, okay, I've got a copy of your plan. You were going to get the applications for a student loan and have them filled out by today. Do you? Let me see them. And if you don't, then you've got to sit down right then with them and do what you have to do. Have accountability so you know you're going to have to face somebody besides yourself. Because you might take your excuses, but they may not. So you want somebody that you give license to hold your feet to the fire. So that's number seven. You're not quite finished, though. There's another step to this accountability. And it's the accountability to yourself. And I want you to write down the answer to this question. How will I feel when I obtain my goal? How will I feel when I obtain my goal? What will it mean to you? And if you can't answer that question with great clarity, you might have the wrong goal. But I'm betting if you've gone to all of this trouble to figure this out, you don't have the wrong goal. So answer the question, how are you going to feel when you achieve this goal? What's it going to mean to you to know that you've taken control of your life and you have achieved this goal instead of letting days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months, months turn into years, and years turn into a lifetime? Write down how you're going to feel. You're going to feel proud. You're going to feel fulfilled. You're going to feel excited. You're going to feel energized. You're going to feel like you have a second chance. You're going to feel like you've set a great example for your kids. I mean, how are you going to feel? So now you've become proactive, right? So what's the next thing I want to put in your playbook? Number eight, you may hear this and think, oh, Dr. Phil, you're getting a little paranoid here. No, I'm not getting paranoid. i just been in this game a long time. Number eight is you must keep things close to the vest. You must keep things close to the vest. Now, why am I saying that? Well, there are a lot of reasons I'm saying that. Number one, you always want to maintain a little mystery because with mystery comes mastery. It is true that Familiarity can breed contempt. You always want to maintain a certain degree of mystery. I can also tell you that, again, life is a competition. Some people really rankle at that. They go, oh, man, I don't like this being a competition. That puts pressure on me. It makes me anxious. Well, look, life isn't a competition since you listened to this. It's always been a competition. Maybe you're just getting that into your consciousness, but it has always been a competition. We're just acknowledging it for the first time. I'm just saying there are some things you just don't want to be telling everybody because it is competitive. There's pressure in the competitive arena. As I've often said, pressure is privilege. That's okay. You want to be in a situation that matters. If you've got a job without pressure, you ain't got a job. It's not really a job. You're just going down somewhere and they're paying you money and then you go home. If you don't have any responsibilities, if you don't have any pressure, if there's no competition, if nobody wants your job, if nobody wants your spouse, then you've either got the crummiest job and the crummiest spouse on the planet, or you're kidding yourself. Because I promise you, there is always somebody around that is more than happy to take what's yours. That's what we were talking about when we started talking about baiters early on. Remember, baiter, backstabber, abuser, imposter, taker, exploiter, reckless. There are people that are ready to take what is yours. So you need to keep things close to the vest. My dad used to say, boy, don't ever miss a good chance to shut up. And I've never forgotten that. 
Now, I keep talking about competition, and you may think, well, competition is vulgar. Competition is beneath me. Well, okay. But my point is, it's going on whether you like it or whether you don't. You just need to be careful who you tell what. I'm going to give you a really good example. This came up in my private practice many years ago. I had a woman that was really steeped in inertia, just really, really was. And I was telling her some of the things I'm telling you now. And I'm saying, look, you got to believe enough in yourself to get out there and reach for what you want and don't get caught in a comfort zone. I mean, come on, take a chance, take a risk. And you say, well, what if I fail? I say, okay, well, what if you fail? We'll talk about that in a minute. But let's just talk about what you want. The truth was, she had been in the same job for six or seven years, and it was kind of a dead-end street for it. She worked for a law firm. There was a new job that had come open at a law firm in the same building, about six floors up, that she had heard about that was a definite promotion. She was a paralegal, and this was a job that managed many paralegals. She was very excited about the job. It meant a $15,000 a year raise, and it meant less tedious work. It meant really a step up. She really was getting her courage up, and she was very excited about it. And there were three or four of these paralegals that she worked with at her place of work, and she was telling them, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to step out there. I'm going to get this job. I'm going to take the chance. I'm going to get out there and see what happens. She came back in for her next appointment, and she was absolutely heartbroken, absolutely crestfallen. One of the women that she worked with at her firm went upstairs, applied for the job, and got it. And how did she know about it? My patient told her about it. She was excited about it, and she didn't keep it close to the vest. She talked about said, oh, I don't know if I can do it. I, I'm going to try. I don't know. I'm going to go up there on Friday. I'm going to do it. I, I just said, oh, I'm scared to death, but I'm going to do it. 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 I'm going up there Friday at 3 o'clock. Her friend got the job Thursday at noon. She went up there on her lunch hour Thursday at noon. She knew all about the job. She had her resume all ready. She went up there, interviewed for the job, and they hired her on the spot. They called that afternoon and canceled the interview for Friday afternoon. And she was just heartbroken. She said, I, w why? Well, we filled the position. Did not tell her it was her friend. And soon thereafter, her friend said, oh, I'm really excited. I, I went and applied for that job, and they hired me. I, I didn't think they would. If you don't want me to take it, I won't. But I figured there's probably 100 people applying for it, so I thought I'll throw my hat in the ring. I didn't figure that you would care. I knew you wouldn't, it wouldn't make a difference to you, and I didn't figure I'd get the job anyway. And I was just shocked when they offered it to me. But listen, if you don't want me to take it, I won't take it. She didn't keep her plans close to the vest. If she hadn't told these women that she was competing with about this opportunity, I have no doubt she would have gotten that job. Why do I have no doubt? Because she was upstream from the woman that got the job. She was better qualified. She had better experience. We role-played the interview. I helped her with the resume. I have no doubt she would have gotten that job. But she did not keep it close to the vest and blabbed about it and lost the opportunity. You have to be careful who you tell what. Now, there will be a very small group of people in your life that you can trust. You will meet people that are like-minded. You will meet what I call your balcony people. You'll meet the people that are in your balcony, that are cheering you on, that want the best for you, that will work with you, not against you, that you can trust that are loyal to you, that share values with you. And the collective power of a group of like-minded people that hold the same values is really powerful. I told you in an earlier Living by Design that I had never met 
a true champion that was a Lone Ranger. Every true champion I've ever met had a nucleus of people around them that shared their passion, shared their goals. And every true champion I ever met not only lived with passion, but they created passion for everyone around them. It wasn't just that they were passionate about what they were doing. They found a way for everyone around them to be passionate. That's the true mark of a leader, a true mark of a winner, a true mark of a champion. It's not just that they have purpose and passion, but that they create that for everybody around them. So now it's not additive, it's multiplicative. And if you can identify that group, then you have created a nucleus of people that you may meet from any walk of life that will impact you in every walk of your life. And I'll tell you how you can differentiate them from most of the people in your life. It has to do with loyalty. You see, most people are loyal to their need for you. They're not loyal to you. They're loyal to their need for you. And when their need for you goes away, their loyalty to you goes away. As long as they need you, they are loyal to you. But when that need goes away, their loyalty to you dries up. Now, that's been talked about a lot of different ways. Maybe it's a fair-weather friend. You know, they're there when everything is fine, but if you have problems, you call them with a need, they're kind of not there. They're busy. They don't answer the phone. As long as you're serving a purpose for them, everything's great. But when you need something, they're gone. Let me restate that so it's clear. They're loyal to their need for you. And when the need goes away, so does their loyalty to you. Everything's fine until you need something. When you need something, oh, wait a minute. This was all fine when you were serving me. But now that you need something, no way. A true friend is both a giver and a receiver. Remember what I said about Bader. The T is taker. There are people in this world that are takers. They just take, 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 but don't ever give. So what you're looking for is that small group of people that are like-minded, and your true test is whether they're there when you need them. You have a problem. Something's gone off the rails in your life. You've got a crisis. You reach out to them. Are they there or did they get busy? Do they answer the call? Those that answer the call, those are the ones you hang on to. That's why they say the definition of a friend, that's those who are coming in the door when everybody else is going out. Who but a friend would run into a burning building? Well, a friend would if you're in there. That's what you want to know. That's what you're looking for. I want to talk to you about one more thing. I told you I was going to give you an example of manipulation. I gave you the example that I'm trying to manipulate you now by talking to you about all these things. But in number nine, I'm going to give you some real world examples of why manipulation is a good thing to do, a healthy thing to do. Number nine is going to surprise you a little bit. Number nine, You must always be in investigative mode. You must always be in investigative mode. Now, when I say investigative mode, I don't mean that you're parked outside somebody's house. I don't mean that you're following your coworkers home. I don't mean that you're digging into the background of everybody. I'm talking about investigative mode in terms of being psychologically minded. Now, you've heard me say, that you should always be situationally aware. And in this day and time, Lord knows we need to be. You walk into a restaurant, a crowded room, you need to take stock of where you are and who's in there. I always do that. I've done that for 45 years. It's natural to me now. I've taught it to my boys. I have a son on tour right now, and he's in 
arenas with 25,000 people. I insist that he be situationally aware. Management for the tour meets with all of them before they go on stage and discuss exit routes, rally points, all of those things. They're situationally aware that things can go south, particularly in this day and time. You should always be situationally aware. If I walk into a restaurant and sit down and it's crowded, I scan the crowd and look for the most unstable people in there. I mark them. I look where they are. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm right. But in my mind, I find the most unstable people in there. Because if something's going to go south, I figure it's going to be from one of those people. I need to know where they are and who they are. I'm asking you to do more than be situationally aware. I'm asking you to be actively in investigative mode. Because if we can agree that the majority of life is a competition, then you need to be proactively in investigative mode, constantly gathering data and information. Now, baiters do this. And they misuse the information. I want you to do it to use the information. You remember when I was talking about being a trial scientist at Courtroom Sciences, and I said, we won cases because we out-prepared the other side. And what I meant by out-prepare them was we were in investigative mode. We discovered everything. We dug up everything there was to dig up. And we weren't afraid to ask ourselves the hard questions about our own case. Some people are in denial. They don't want to look at the negatives about their own case. And then they get blindsided with them at trial. That never happened with us. We looked at the most horrible things about our own case. Before we ever got to trial, we were never ambushed because we took a harder look than they could ever look because we knew where the bodies were buried and they didn't. I'm asking you to out-prepare everybody in your life. You need to be psychologically minded. And by that, I mean you need to understand what's the psychological situation of everybody that you're in competition with. What are their agendas? What are their motivations? What's going on in someone's life? What are the groups, maybe at work? Are there alliances? Certain people hang together. Are there warring factions? And if you're going to be psychologically minded, you need to be keenly aware that things often occur for other than the apparent reasons. So you've got to be psychologically minded. You've got to be aware if you are in competition for a promotion or a raise or an assignment, then you need to be aware of what other people's strengths and weaknesses are. If you want your boss to see you as essential, then you need to know what he or she is not good at so you can make sure they're aware that you are good at that. Now, Let's talk about manipulation for a second. Let's say that one of the goals that you've set is you want the guy you're dating to pop the question. You're wanting to motivate him to pop the question. Now, is that wrong? Is there anything wrong with you wanting him to pop the question? I say no. If you've made the decision that this is the guy, if you're in love with him, but he's dragging his feet, you need to be in investigative mode. And you need to be psychologically evaluating what's his problem? What are the obstacles here? What's his motivation or lack thereof? I believe very much in need satisfaction selling. Maybe his parents have been through an ugly divorce. And so he is afraid of what can happen when you get married that it can wind up in an ugly divorce then psychologically you are aware he needs reassurance in this area. His fears need to be diffused in this area. If you're in investigative mode and you find out that his parents have been through an ugly divorce, that he is very burned by that, he has great concerns about that. Now, you've been in investigative mode, you've learned that, you've found out how he feels about that what was done to impact him about that, so you know what he needs. He needs to be reassured. He needs to have those fears diffused. So this is where the manipulation comes in. 
you don't need to be insidious about it. But when you talk to him about this and you talk about where's this relationship going, do you want to talk about what kind of house you're going to get? Or do you want to talk about what is important in your relationship with him? What things that you two should find some peace about? Address the needs he has. And in doing that, you're doing a service to him. You're talking about what matters to him. You're giving him an opportunity to voice his concerns, his needs, his fears. Is that manipulative? Sure it is. Is that insidious? Absolutely not. You can tell him straight up, I know, I sense that you have been burned by your parents having a very ugly breakup. I want to talk about that. I want to see if we can get past that. Okay, now there's nothing insidious about this at all. You're telling him, I want to talk about that. I want to see if we can get past that. I want to see if I can get you at ease with that. So that's just another way of saying I want to manipulate your thinking from a pathological fear to a healthy acknowledgement and acceptance. And I would have no problem, zero, zip, absolutely no problem with you saying, okay, I want to try and manipulate your thinking about this. I want to change your thinking about it. I want to alter the way you think about this. I have no problem with using the word manipulation. I have no problem with using the word change. Be totally upfront about it. But do your homework before you start because you want to talk about what matters to them, to him to the people at work, whoever your audience is, my belief is you will be successful if you meet people where they are instead of expecting them to meet you where you are. If they are steeped in fear, if they are paralyzed with fear and anxiety about what may happen, you're going to get old waiting for them to resolve that on their own and come to you. Why should you do that? Why should you not call it what it is and make a upfront, totally transparent effort to get them past that? And if you can't, don't you want to know it? Of course you do. If that is such a pathological anxiety that they'll never get past it, you need to know that now, not later. So what I'm saying is be completely upfront, nothing insidious, nothing underhanded, nothing behind their back, nothing sneaking up on them, nothing where they don't know what you're doing and why you're doing it, but do it. Be straight up front. Do you think I don't do that every day on Dr. Phil? Of course I do. Somebody comes in there and says, I am not a drug addict and I don't need rehab. Do you think I don't set about manipulating their thinking about that to get them to the help they need? Of course I do. And I tell them straight up, I'm going to talk you out of that. I'm going to show you where you're wrong. When you are in investigative mode, you are going to discover if people have insidious objectives in dealing with you and are trying to manipulate you with a hidden agenda. Because by you doing it transparently, you will become keenly aware of when it's being attempted insidiously. Let me give you an example. Let's say there's someone at work that you don't trust. You've been paying attention and you've just seen that she is really always a game player. I'm one of those people that believes if they'll do it with you, they'll do it to you. So if they're over there gossiping with you about somebody else, what in the hell makes you think they're not going to walk away from you and go get with somebody else and talk to them about you? So if somebody comes to you and tries to set you up, but you're psychologically minded in investigative mode and there's something about this person that just doesn't ring right, your intuition, your gut is telling you You shake hands with them, you need to count your fingers. You just believe they're just so crooked, they screw their socks on in the morning. You don't know why, but you've just got that intuition. And they say to you, wow, last night I was here late and I saw the boss leaving. And when she got out into the parking lot, 
I could tell she was really staggering. It just was so clear she was drunk. Do you remember when we had dinner together? Did she drink something? Okay, now, what possible good could come out of this conversation for you? Remember, we take very specific outcomes to warrant a known outcome. What possible good could come out of you gossiping about the boss with somebody you got a gut feeling about and it ain't good? Because let me tell you how this plays out. You say, well, yeah, I remember when we went to dinner, I, th- I think she had a martini, maybe two. I don't, I don't remember. So she says, yeah, maybe so. Okay, see you later. The next morning, she stops by the boss's office and says, hey, look, it's none of my business. I don't want to get into it, but I stopped by Sharon's desk last night, and she was talking about you drinking martinis when we went out to dinner. I just thought it was odd, none of my business, but I just thought you ought to know because I just don't think that she ought to be talking about that around the office, but none of my business, got to run. Now, did she lie? Nope. Everything she said was true. She stopped by the desk, and you did comment that she drank some martinis at dinner, maybe two. Now, she left out all the setup. She left out all the con, and you may never know she stopped by the boss's office. You may never know that you've been labeled as talking behind the boss's back about drinking. Maybe the boss has a drinking problem. And you now are labeled as a threat to exposure. Things often happen for other than the apparent reasons. And unless you are psychologically minded and are asking yourself what possible good could come out of this, you're better off to excuse yourself and keep on walking. So I guess I am asking you to be a bit of a private investigator, but psychologically, pay attention to who hangs out with who. Who's the office gossip? Who are the warring factions? Who's the brown nose? Who seems to be the person that always seems to be running a hidden agenda? If you stay on your toes, you're going to be a hard target to hit. And the truth of the matter is, if you evaluate the entire population, there's a significant percentage that would rather cheat to win than earn their way to the top. We're just going to be too good for them. We're going to be too sharp. We're going to be too on our game. We're going to keep things close to the vest. We're going to be in investigative mode. And we're going to talk about more and more of this in the weeks to come. Please review these things. Please go to the website and look at the outlines and the list because I don't want this to be something that goes into your short-term memory and then you lose it. This is a playbook for life. And I want it to impact the way you do business. You have transactions with your significant other. You parent your kids. You deal with everything you do. I want to hear from you. I've been getting some really good comments. We are going to talk about them soon. I'm Dr. Phil. Thanks for listening.